Yes, I'm uh, happy to be here now and to present um, uh, some ideas or, or our approach of uh, the University of Heidelberg. Uh, and I'm presenting this not for me, so on, on behalf of a whole group of researchers of Heidelberg who are related to this. And um, yeah, I would like to talk about this a new framework, we call it uh, Awesome, which you can use to analyze history data. And we have already heard uh, about the challenges a little bit. And uh, yeah, maybe we can solve some of the challenges with our framework. So what does awesome actually mean? So we, this is an artificial name of our framework. And it's uh, composed of several ideas. So there's OSM inside, obviously, for OpenStreetMap. Then there's this H something, history something inside. So we have a tool that you can do something with history of OpenStreetMap data and yeah, obviously it just sounds uh, awesome. Um, I would like to take the advantage to uh, announce the workshop that is taking place right after the next uh, break uh, where you can learn how to use this framework to do this kind of analysis yourself and um, it will be in the other room S15 uh, just after the next uh, break. So who, who are we? Who is um, actually developing this awesome thing? Um, we are from the University of Heidelberg in Germany and there's the research group of GI Science led by Professor Zipf. Um, and uh, recently he uh, created a new institute called HiGit and in this HiGit group there are three yeah, focus research groups. One is uh, dealing or developing the open root service, you may know. This is around like 10 years using OpenStreetMap data for routing. Another group is uh, dealing with disaster and humanitarian management. It's closely related also to the humanitarian OpenStreetMap team and so on. And our team, the Big Spatial Data Analytics group that I'm working also in, is uh, doing this um, awesome framework. So before showing some examples and some, some details of the framework, I would like to uh, yeah, share some thoughts of why should we analyze the history? So what can we, what can we learn from the history? And um, yeah, there are so many different possibilities to, to make analy an analysis with uh, the history data. So I, thought it would be maybe a good idea to have some graphic in mind or some simple thing. So I draw this triangle here to have the different aspects that are always found in a uh, history analysis. So we have the data and then the user that created the data and the time stamp when the data was created. So somehow these things are always uh, in, in a history analysis. And if you only look at the map, then you just look at the data and you don't know who created the data, you don't know when the data was created, but in the history analysis we are always relating these things to the time property. And um, you can, for example, just have a look at the relation between data and time and then uh, make um, a nice uh, graph of the development of the data, how the data grew and so on. But you can also lo have a look uh, at how the users uh, developed over time, or you can just put everything together in a more complex analysis and see who did what, when, and where. So the data is actually composed of several things, and you have the, the geometry thing, the geometry part of the data, and you also have the, the topic, the, ta the, the tags of the data. So there's a lot of possibilities how you can yeah, create uh, different types of history analysis. And what is the, in the end, uh, we are interested um, in is, um, yeah, not just seeing how the data develops or evolves, but we want to, yeah, get some deeper knowledge about data quality. We've heard it in the talk before. There's this intrinsic data quality also, so, which means, yeah, you just have a look at the data at certain points in time, and then you compare maybe um, the data from one time uh, uh, with the same 
area of, an, of a, a former time and see how it how it evolved, and um, yeah, to to find something some useful measures for data quality. That's not an easy task. There are so many different measures around, and it's always difficult to interpret. Yeah, and the other interesting part of history analysis is to know more about the community, how the community actually creates the map, and um, yeah, maybe find out if there are sub-communities that are dealing with special uh, topics, or maybe communities that are active in a certain region, or sometimes maybe you have communities that are just existing for a certain amount of time. If you think of mapathons, for example, people gather, do something on a specific topic just for a short period of time, and then the community is gone uh, uh, away. So there's a lot of dynamics in this, who does what, when, and, and where, and why. And all these are questions that you can maybe answer with uh, history data analysis. Okay, so... Um, yeah, there are a lot of challenges. We heard it before, so... Um, our idea is how can we yeah, make this data treasure available to everybody. Uh, so how can we query this, this data at every arbitrary temporal or spatial resolution? So there are some approaches that do some pre-processing, then you have maybe only yearly or quarterly uh, views on the data. But we wanted to create a framework where you can say, I want to know how did the data look like at that specific point in time. And what was also important for us that we do not pre-filter the data or interpret the data before when we yeah, set up our data format. So every thing should be in the data, also the, the mistakes, also the bad data, everything should be findable in that data to be anal analyzed later. So no cleanup is made, no repair of geometries or something. Everything should be there like in the original data. And then, yeah, the other challenge is that it's quite uh, a lot of data and many people may be scared a little bit to do them themselves, these kind of things, because yeah, you need quite a lot of resources if you want to analyze a larger region. Many people can do it for just small extracts, maybe for a city or so. That's okay, but um, yeah, if you want to have a bigger area analyzed, then uh, it gets uh, quite complicated if you just do it on your own computer. And therefore, uh, also the performance is uh, a big topic. So uh, the idea was to find a data format or data scheme, database scheme, that allows us to um, process the data not only in parallel on one machine, but also split up the data and distribute it on many machines and uh, scale up with the, with the amount of data. Um, so, uh, but not everybody has a computing cluster at home, so this is also something that uh, we wanted uh, our framework to be very flexible, so you, you can either run it on your local PC, maybe with an extract of the data of a certain area, like a country or a city or whatever, but fits onto your local PC, but also be able to distribute it on a larger computing cluster and maybe offer this kind of uh, analysis as a service for the community, so not everybody has to set up its own computing thing, but just can access history um, data over uh, some services. And the usability is also a big question, so we would like to yeah, make it easy to use this thing for different target groups. Not everybody is a programmer, uh, but some are. So there are different uh, API levels that we, um, um, that we have, so um, everybody can find its um, point to, to get involved. And yeah, obviously there, there are different um, yeah, flexibility of k the kind of analysis that you can do, but um, later uh, we'll talk more about that. Now um, I would like to go on for some uh, examples. 
um, one example about data quality that has been done in our group and presented earlier this year in the ISCRAM conference um, is about um, yeah, data quality after the, <coughs> the disaster that happened in Nepal in 2015. And um, the colleagues from our uh, disaster uh, group have made these uh, graphs with our um, framework. And what you can see here is one year of uh, the Nepal data set and how, how the data um, evolved there. And the, you see the red uh, bar on the graph, which is the, the time when the earthquake happened. And then afterwards, we already hit it. A lot of, uh, a lot of uh, people contributed uh, to, to edit the data in Nepal. And you see uh, the number of contributors uh, going up uh, very quickly after the the earthquake event and then going slowly down again. So this is what we expected. And then um, you see a little, a little bit shifted in time that um, first highways were created from remote uh, mapping and then uh, the impassable information was added a little bit later to the highways that were mapped. So there's some some uh, people that uh, get this information, is this highway uh, uh, intact or not, and put that information a little later on that uh, roads. And what you can see here is that um, the number of contributors goes down after the event very quickly, but the quality of the data is uh, actually maintained over several months, and the number of impassable highways goes down again. So the there's not just one event creating a lot of data and then leave, leave them alone and then it, it gets wrong when the streets are repaired again. But it seems that it is also updated and the quality uh, is a good sign for the quality that the level of the impassable highways is, goes back like the same level as in the beginning before uh, the earthquake. So you already see you have to, if you want to make some statement about data quality, you have to have a look at really a lot of different aspects of the same thing. It's not just one measure and then it's good quality or bad quality. You have to always look at a lot of different things. What we see here is um, on the top the length of the highways, which has this classical curve of getting complete. So a lot of growth in the beginning and then yeah, getting to some completeness point which is also a good sign for data quality if you have this flat curve in the end. And then so something very interesting in the middle, uh, we have a high peak of highways classified as highway road. So highway road is actually not a really good highway class, but it has been used to just say there is a road, but we don't actually know which kind of road is it? Is it residential service, uh, secondary tertiary? You don't really know this from aerial images. So, but it's important to tell the first responders you can go somewhere. There is a street, but we don't know what uh, kind it is. But uh, what you can see is going down and this means these highways at first classified as uh, something highway road getting tagged and classified afterwards. So this is also a pattern which uh, uh, tells you the quality is increasing over time and also over several months after the, the event. It's still maintained the data. Someone from, from there must have had a look on the streets and classified them. The third graph here, you see the, the percentage of highways that have a name, which was very high before the event. So you can say, oh, cool, good data quality, but actually this is because there were very few highways at all. So you must be careful with interpretation always. And um, actually the number of hi highways with names goes down after the event. But uh, what does this mean? Actually, this would uh, be interesting to see at what level at other areas this highway with or without names is to, to make a statement, is this, is this normal or is it bad or good or 
maybe the highways just don't have names. There's many, many reasons. So, okay. Um, and then there's um, these two graphs. So the idea was also to um, yeah, make a statement about the data quality um, in relation to how good is it to use for routing uh, applications. And then you find um, that uh, a lot of roads were created with junctions that were not noted. So you cannot see this on the map, so you have a nice nice uh, a map with all the uh, street crossings and so on, but the algorithm of the routing application has a problem with uh, these kind of crossings where you cannot uh, turn uh, to the other street then. So obviously a lot of streets have been created, but no real junction was uh, put in. And um, same thing is with endpoints that are really close to the, to the next way. So the assumption is um, if there is an endpoint to a street very, very close, probably it should be connected. Uh, there are reasons why they are not in, in several cases, but uh, for this analysis, an analysis uh, the assumption was, okay, let's count all these nearby nodes uh, to have uh, an idea of how good is the street network for the uh, routing application. And uh, yeah, and you, as you can see, um, the classification of highways before, this is uh, recognizable on the map. It's not classified as a primary or whatever. You can see this. And very fast after the event, the classification uh, took place. But this kind of thing you cannot see visually on the map. And people just don't know maybe uh, that there is a problem. And so I don't know actually which kind of road type causes these problems. I have uh, an idea. So maybe there are, if you, if you want to yeah, create a lot of uh, street, streets in a short period of time because of the disaster, um, then maybe you just uh, yeah, put long lines over the residential areas, uh, put, uh, put all the, the things uh, in one uh, large line thing, and then just don't make the crossings. And then, uh, yeah, this, but this is just an assumption. So this is something that should be investigated closer. Okay, this is an example of how to tackle data quality for a certain topic. So always keep in mind it's not simple. You have to look at really a lot of different aspects of the data and be very careful with the interpretation. Then an example for the other big topic, the community dynamics, dynamics as we call it. Uh, what you see here is the number of unique mappers that are editing highways on a monthly base um, in Italy. And um, you see the community is uh, growing over time. And it seems that there's also some saturation taking place that around, I don't know, like 1,000 users per month are editing the roads in Italy. It's quite interesting, but there's, second, there's a second pattern in this, in this graph, which is also interestingly, that there are some seasonal effects. So every summertime, there's a little peak in the, in the uh, activity. So we can just, uh, yeah, don't know why this is, but uh, maybe this is uh, people who are bored uh, of lying on the beach and uh, go out and do some mapping uh, in their vacations or whatever. So, so maybe it's uh, tourists or maybe it's just, uh, I don't know, people go uh, to the mountains in the, in the hot uh, summer month and do some mapping there, I don't know. Yeah, but these patterns are like, uh, interesting in this, what, what, what makes it so interesting to analyze the history data. Okay, and then another um, example is, um, yeah, this is quite a classical graph. This is this typical long tail thing that there's a lot of mappers here that just have edited at w on one day OSM data. Like uh, the green bar is for Milan area, 
like over 60% um, of the mappers that map Milan uh, just edit it one day. And then uh, the people that are really doing, doing a lot of work are uh, very few, like here, like if you have a look here, five, uh, up to 500 um, edit days, uh, it's just a very small group. And if you have another look on these same groups of people in the next graph, it's the same groups of people. <laughs> okay. Um, yeah, you can see uh, um, that these few people have edited more days altogether than all the, all the one-day mappers. Uh, um, yeah. Okay, so I may repeat the reminder to go to the uh, workshop uh, in the next session and um, get more to know about our how to use it, so all the different APIs that we are providing. Um, and um, yeah, one last announcement. The um, framework is uh, going um, open source today and you can go on GitHub and then get the software there and do these things uh, on your own. Yeah, thanks. Really, thank you very much. <laughs> we have four minutes for questions. Um, there are discussions on the last uh, state of the map uh, concerning the data model of OpenStreetMap to change it uh, and uh, on this occasion uh, to anonymize the users. Uh, would this uh, take harm to your, to, to your project? Well, if you do some anonymization on users, you can, could still maybe use some artificial user IDs that are not traceable to a username maybe and uh, find out about communities without knowing exactly who is part of that community. So this would be one possible solution for that. Don't, don't track the individual users, what has this user done uh, over his his OSM career, so to say, uh, but just yeah, have a more uh, a generalized um, view on the community without yeah knowing each individual then in these groups. Maybe this is uh, one one solution to that. Yeah, I'm just curious if you have done the same analysis, uh, differentiating uh, expert, let's say, users on, on the data quality, expert users and, and new ones. If you see that, that the patterns of data quality is different on the new edits after disasters. Yeah, actually, we do not have made a lot of uh, special analysis, co concrete analysis. So the focus is to bring this framework to everybody, that everybody can do his own special measure and uh, find out what's the best measure maybe to, to have these kind of, take these kind of questions. So uh, no, we do, did not uh, do this uh, especially thing. Yeah. Any more questions? So, yeah, maybe. Uh, so, what what is uh, really really nice is that we have these these different levels here of access, and the the most upper one here, the awesome API, is a web API, which has a different kind of um, aggregation analysis built in. So you can you can you can make your own application with just. Uh, yeah, um, requesting this API. This is the most simple access, but you can also go deeper if you have special requirements for for uh, an analysis. Then you you can download the uh, the framework and the data and just have uh, a few lines of code like this to to create uh, the data you want. So this is the uh, Java uh, API for analyzing. This, this kind of data. So it's 
really interesting and it's worth to go to the, to the workshop and learn more about this. So just a few lines of code and then you have uh, the data for such graphs. Thank you very much. Please uh, do well to join the workshop and learn more. Thank you very much, Michael. And thank you all for your participation. Um, please, the organizers, um, has, uh, they've alerted me that uh, uh, you, you are not voting uh, for the posters, so please pass by and...